Welcome to a deep dive into, well, something I'm really passionate about teaching adults. You know, you've given us a ton of resources on this, a real treasure trove on adult education. So let's kind of unlock those secrets. Let's figure out how to be amazing at teaching adults. And it's a fascinating world, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting is we're moving past this this old idea of like the sage on the stage, you know, <laughs> and your sources all make it so clear that adults, they aren't, um, you know, they're not blank slates. Yeah. They're coming to the table with years of experience right. and, and a whole lot of motivation or sometimes, frankly, a lack of it. Yeah, you hit on something I've always found interesting. I remember once uh, I was trying to teach my uncle how to use a new phone app and it was a total disaster. Oh, no. And these sources talk about andragogy, this idea that adults learn so differently. So uh -huh. for someone like me who maybe has a little room for improvement in the teaching department, what's the takeaway there? Well, I think I think your uncle's phone fiasco is actually a perfect example. Oh. So andragogy, which uh, was a term coined by by Malcolm Knowles, really stresses that um, adults they need to see that relevance. Okay. Of what they're learning to their own lives, mm -hmm. right? It's about tapping into the knowledge they already have. Yeah. Tapping into their experiences and using those as um, as valuable resources. So instead of me, you know, launching into a lecture about all the features of this app, I should connect it to something he already does on his phone. Exactly. Maybe like, you know, how could this app make it easier for him to manage photos, something he actually does and is interested in? Yeah, because adults, they want to be self-directed, right? Mm -hmm. They, they want to be um, active in that learning process. They don't want to just be passively receiving it, right? Totally. So, so designing, um, training, or teaching in a way that lets them maybe set some goals, right? Maybe choose some activities, yeah. or even just you know what, determine their own pace. Yeah, can make a huge difference. It makes a lot of sense, and it ties into something else. These sources all kind of emphasize motivation, right? Like it's not enough to just have like the best content. Yeah, you got to ignite that spark in people. Totally. So, what are some of those key motivators for for adults? What makes them want to learn? It's definitely a mix of of internal and external factors. Okay. Right. So, yes, external factors those those come into play. Things like, you know, maybe their job requires them to learn something, mm. or they need a certification. Right. But what really really fuels that fire, fuels that motivation, is that internal desire. Yeah. That desire for for personal growth, professional growth. Maybe they want a promotion. Right. Maybe they want to change careers entirely. Yeah. Or, or maybe they just they just crave that satisfaction of you know, hey, I mastered this new skill. Yeah, it's about like being empowered, right? It's like that aha moment where something just clicks. Exactly. And you're like, wow, I can do this thing that I couldn't do before. Yeah. And that actually brings us to another really important concept Okay. that's highlighted in, in a lot of these resources you sent, the three domains of learning. Okay, break those down for me because uh, I got to be honest, at first glance, it sounds a little intimidating. Okay. Three domains of learning. What are we talking about? So think of it this way. Imagine you're you're teaching someone to bake bread. Okay. A very useful skill. Delicious. Delicious, exactly. The first domain is is what we call the cognitive domain. Okay. And this is all about knowledge, about understanding. Got it. So in the baking example, this is, you know, you understand the ingredients. Okay. You know what the ratios are. Okay. You even kind of get the science behind, you know, why yeast makes the dough rise. Okay. So it's like the head stuff. It's yes. like the factual foundation. Exactly. What about psychomotor? That sounds way more complicated. It does, but it's not as scary as it sounds. Okay. Psychomotor, think motor skills. Oh. Right. Yeah. So it's the hands-on part. Got it. So in our example... It's the mixing. Okay. The kneading. Yes. The shaping. Okay. All those actual physical skills. The doing. The doing of the baking. I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. But, okay, so we've got the head, we got the hands. What's the third domain? All right, so the third one is the effective domain. Effective. And this one, I think, often gets overlooked. Okay. But it's so important. Right. This domain is all about attitudes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Values, emotions. Interesting. So, in our baking scenario, this is... You know, the learner's confidence, okay. their their passion for baking, maybe even their, their ability to troubleshoot when things go wrong. Yeah, like when the yeast doesn't activate and the bread doesn't rise. Exactly. So it's not just about, you know, teaching the steps. It's about, like, fostering this love of baking. This feeling of, wow, I can create something. That's really cool. But how do we actually take all of this theory, this andragogy, these domains, and turn it into something practical? Like, how do I actually use this 
when I'm teaching. That's where understanding those stages of learning comes in. Okay. And and your sources offer, you know, a couple of different models that, that can help us here. Mm-hmm. One that I find really, really helpful is the um, the conscious competence model. Oh, I've heard of this. Yeah. This is all about, like, how aware are we yes. of our own kind of skill level? Exactly. So it starts with what we call unconscious incompetence. Okay. Which basically means you're clueless. Okay. But you don't even know it. Right. Like you've never even you've never touched a whisk in your life, let alone mm-hmm. try to, you know, tackle sourdough. <laughs> yeah. Been there. Right. <laughs> and then from there, you move into conscious incompetence. Okay. So now you're aware of how much you don't know. Right. <laughs> now you're intimidated by the recipe. Exactly. All those steps. And this this is where a good teacher, you know, can really make all the difference. Yeah. By breaking down those steps. Okay. Into manageable chunks. So you're saying, like, even just by understanding where someone I is in that model. Yes. Like, are they clueless? Are they aware that they're clueless? Yes. That helps me as a teacher figure out, okay, how do I adjust exactly to meet that need? A hundred percent. And then, of course, as the learner progresses, right, they move into conscious competence. Okay. So now they can bake a pretty decent loaf of bread. Okay. But to still have to... Like think about every single step, right? And then finally, they reach that that you know peak of unconscious competence, right? Just right. practically baking in their sleep. That's the dream. That's what we want. Exactly. But before we get to like you know baking championship level, um, you mentioned another model, the learning cycle. What's that all about? Yeah. So the learning cycle it really emphasizes um, practical application. Yeah. Right. Putting things into practice. Yeah. And it starts with what we call buy-in. Interesting. Which is really about grabbing the learner's attention. Okay. Showing them why this skill, why this knowledge even matters to them. Okay. So in our baking example, this could be, I don't know, maybe showing them a picture. Okay. Of this incredible loaf of bread. Yes. Now you're speaking my language. Right. Beautiful food photography. Exactly. Or maybe, maybe even letting them sample some delicious bread. Oh, even better. Get those senses involved. Exactly. And then, you know, once you've hooked them, you've got their attention. Then it moves into what we call that take it in phase. Okay. And this is where you start delivering the information. Okay. Right. But you're doing it in those digestible chunks. Right. Small bites. Exactly. And you're using a variety of methods to keep things engaging. Okay. So, you know, maybe it's some videos on on different kneading techniques. Uh, maybe it's some diagrams about you know, how the yeast works. Maybe it's even, you know, what a, a field trip to a local bakery. I love it. Right. Getting them out there, seeing it in action. And then, crucially, right, we move into the try it phase. Yes. This is the hands-on part. Let's bake. Let's bake. This is where those baking workshops come in, right? Yeah. Yeah. You got to give them that space to make mistakes, mm. to get messy. Yeah. And, and really experience those aha moments. You're learning by doing. Exactly. But it doesn't end there, right? No. The final stage is what we call use it. Okay. So this is where you're encouraging those learners to take what they've learned and actually apply it in their own lives. Okay. In their own kitchens. Got it. So maybe they're baking for their families. Okay. Maybe they're experimenting with new recipes. Right. Maybe they're even, you know, sharing their their newfound knowledge with friends. It becomes like the self-sustaining cycle. Exactly. That's really cool. But before we like get everyone out there baking bread and, and you know, starting their own bakeries, um, one thing that these sources really stress is that like you got to tailor the training to different individuals. Yes. Right. Like not everyone learns the same way. So how do we even begin to figure out what those unique needs are? That's such a good question. And, and it starts with with asking the right questions. OK. Right. And your sources suggest you know, a mix of things, surveys, interviews, oh, yeah, yeah. even just just observing the learners as they as they start to engage with the material. OK, so let's say like I'm teaching a group of people to use some new design software. OK. A survey could tell me like, OK, what's their experience with similar programs? Exactly. But how does something like an interview give me even more? So an interview lets you go deeper, right? OK. You can really dig into their specific goals. OK. So. Are they are they hoping to use this software, you know, for a personal project right. or is this something that's, you know, going to help them in their career? And by understanding their motivations, yeah, that lets you personalize that learning. 
It's so interesting you say that because I love this idea of observation yeah. because sometimes you can just tell like by someone's body language Ooh. or how they approach a new task, like what kind of learner they might be. A hundred percent. Right. Some people just dive right in. Yeah. Other people need like, you know, step by step instructions. Totally. And so by observing that you can again it's like you're adjusting in the moment exactly okay so we've we've gone out there we've gathered all this information we kind of know like what makes our learners tick how do we take all that and make actual learning objectives you know like what are we actually trying to accomplish yeah think of learning outcomes mm. like your training roadmap okay right they tell you where you're going okay and how you'll know when you get there I like it. Right. And, and you know, your sources, they emphasize using those action verbs. Okay. To make them measurable. Right. So instead of saying, like, learners will understand design principles. Right. It would be learners will apply design principles to create a website layout. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's not just understand, which is kind of vague. It's uh, you will do this thing. Yes. You will create. That's... I like that. It feels very outcome oriented. It is. Very specific. Yeah. Okay, so we've got our kind of learner needs. We've got our learning outcomes. What's what's next in building this this amazing training session? It feels like you know we're, we're ready to really build this like perfect training session, right? Yes. But you know these these sources you sent me they they kind of make a distinction between what I call like skill based training and knowledge based training. Mm -hmm. How do I know which one I need? That's a great question. Yeah. And it's, it's a really important difference. Okay. Um, and it really comes down to what you want your learners, what do you want them to be able to do right. after the training? Okay. So skill-based training, that's all about practical application. Okay. Right. Think of, think of like a mechanic okay. who's learning to rebuild an engine. Got it. Or a chef, yeah. right? Learning to make a souselin. Okay. It's it's very hands-on. Yeah. It's action-oriented. So it's like lots of demonstrations, yes. simulations, like really getting in there. Yeah, you're you're giving them those those tools, those techniques yeah. to actually perform the task. Right. Knowledge-based training, that's more about, you know, really imparting information. Okay. Building that understanding. Okay. So think of, I don't know, a history lecture. Right. A workshop on on legal compliance, right? Got it. It's about concepts theories, facts. So less about like physically doing something. Right. And more about kind of like understanding the why behind it. Exactly. Yeah. And and you know, even though I'm I'm kind of, you know, I'm I'm distinguishing them here. Right. They often intertwine. So imagine, you know, a training session on a new medical procedure. Okay. You might start with that debt knowledge base, right? Right. Like here's the science behind this procedure. Yeah. Here are the benefits, mm -hmm. here are the risks. Right. But then you would move into, okay, let's actually practice this technique. Right. Maybe on a simulator. Right. <laughs> Maybe we're going to role play how you'd interact with the patient. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's like building that foundation. Yes. And then giving them those skills to actually apply it. Speaking of applying things, um, these sources, they're, they're big on assessment. Yeah. And not just like a final exam. Right it's up. like throughout the whole thing. Exactly. So what's the thinking there? Think of it like like baking a cake, right? Okay, yeah. You wouldn't just you wouldn't just stick it in the oven and hope for the best. No. Right. You got to check on it. You're checking on it periodically. Right. Is it rising? Yeah. Is it baking evenly? Assessment is like checking on that cake throughout the baking process. So it's like we're making sure okay, are we on track? Exactly. Do we need to adjust something? Yeah, you've got those pre-training assessments, right? Mm -hmm. To kind of gauge that existing knowledge. Okay. You've got your formative assessments, so those are happening during the training. Got it. Just to kind of check for understanding along the way. Okay. And then, of course, you have your summative assessments. Oh, okay. At the end. Right. To see what they've learned. To see what they learned. But those don't all have to be, like, you know, scary, high-pressure tests, do they? Not at all. Okay, good. You know, get creative. Yeah. Think group discussions, case studies, presentations. Yeah. Even, even just self-reflections. Okay. Peer feedback. I like it. The key is to to choose methods that align with your your learning objectives, right? Right. And and the overall kind of tone of your training. It's about making it like part of the process. Exactly. Not the scary thing at the end. Right. Speaking of making it fun, how do I use these presentation aids well? Yes. Because oh my goodness, I've sat through some really boring PowerPoints in my day. Oh, we've all been there. Yeah. We've all been there. Right. Death by PowerPoint. Yes, exactly. But they don't have to be that way. Okay, good. 
the key is to remember that, you know, these presentation aids, these visuals, they should enhance your message. Right. Not overshadow it. Okay. Okay. So, you know, use use visuals to simplify complex information. Okay. Um, maybe incorporate some short, engaging videos yeah, hey. just to bring things to life a little bit. Yeah, I like it. Um, you know, design handouts that people can actually take away with them. Okay. And that they'll actually use as resources. So it's all about just being like really strategic. Exactly. And intentional. Yes. With how we use those things. And don't be afraid to use technology either, right? Okay. Interactive quizzes. Okay. Polls. You know, even a well-placed meme or yeah. GIF, right? Yeah. Right. Liven things up. Wow, you can make things fun. Yeah. Memorable. It's true. And beyond like, you know, the the visuals and the tech and all that, we both know like communication, that's everything. Oh, it's crucial. So what are some of the takeaways there? You know, your your sources, they stress the importance of, you know, clear language. Okay. Concise language. Right. Adults are busy people. They are. They they appreciate it when you get to the point. Right. No one wants to sit through fluff. And avoid that jargon. Right. right? Yes. Unless everybody knows exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. But it's not just what you say. No. It's how you say it. Totally. Right. Body language, tone of voice, all that. Exactly. That active listening. That's so crucial. Oh, nice. Right. Pay attention. Yeah. To those verbal cues, those nonverbal cues. Mm -hmm. Are people engaged? Right. Are they confused? Right. Do they need you to clarify something? And you know, this might sound strange, but don't be afraid to use silence. Oh, interesting. Okay. Sometimes that pause, that silence. That's actually more powerful than words. Okay. It gives people time to process. Silence as a teaching tool. I like it. Yes. And while we're on communication, um, you know, the those sources really emphasize like asking the right questions. Oh yes, questions are so important. Right. It's not just like, you know, any questions? No. Okay, moving yeah. on. Right. <laughs> so how do we get that right? Well crafted questions, they can really do so much. Okay. Right. Okay. They they stimulate people to think critically. Mm -hmm. They spark these really insightful discussions. Yeah. And they can help learners make connections that maybe they wouldn't have made on their own. It's true. You know, those open-ended questions, for example. Okay. Those are so powerful. Yeah. Because they, they encourage learners to, to really think beyond just a simple yes or no. It's, it's guiding them toward those aha moments. Yes. But, you know, sometimes even with the best preparation, even when we ask all the right questions, even when the cake looks great, like things don't always go perfectly. Right. We're human. Right. So how can I give like feedback in a way that's that's constructive? Yeah, that's a great question. And encourages growth rather than like, oh, I messed up. I'm terrible at this. You don't want to discourage people. So, you know, your sources talk about this. Um, this sandwich approach. Okay. Have you heard of this? I have, but remind me, what's the sandwich? So the sandwich approach is basically you're you're starting with something positive. Okay. Right. Okay. Then you're addressing those areas for improvement. Okay. But then you're ending on another positive note. So it's like you're sandwiching. Okay. Exactly. Expect the constructive criticism. And you always want to frame your feedback in a way that that empowers that learner to take action. Right. So instead of like, you need to work on your presentation skills, it's uh, it's, hey, I've really, you know, I really appreciated this about your presentation. But, you know, what are some things that, you know, maybe for your next presentation, how could we make it even more engaging? Oh, that's so good. Right. Because it's not just like pointing out the problem. Right. It's like, here's a path forward. Exactly. And speaking of kind of that path forward, those those sources, they also talk about keeping really good records yes. of the training. And I'll be honest, like the documentation is not always the most exciting part. No. But I get why it's important. Wait. It's like, how do we track how things are going? How do we know if something's working or not? It helps you track progress. Right. 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 It helps you figure out, okay, how effective was this training? Right. And it can even help you personalize those future learning experiences. Yeah. Because you have that data. Right. right. So it's like it's closing that loop. Exactly. It's like we do the thing, we see how it went, and then we use that to get better. That's the beauty of it, right? Yeah. It's right. It's it's a journey. It's not a destination. It's a like destination. always learning, always growing, always trying to be better at at sharing that information with other people. And that's what makes it so rewarding, right? It really is. It is. And you know, for for everyone out there who who loves to teach who, who is passionate about sharing what they know and helping others grow, 
remember, like this is this is a craft. It is. It's an art. It's a science. Mm. Embrace it. Experiment. Experiment. Have fun. Yeah. Don't be afraid to try new things. And never stop learning ourselves, mm. right? Exactly. I think that's a great place to kind of cr wrap up this deep dive. Yeah. It's so fascinating. There's so much to learn about how to teach adults well. There is. And I really appreciate you uh, diving into these sources with me. It was my pleasure. So until next time, everyone, happy teaching.